Hello everybody and welcome to the next episode of the Badass Unicorn Summer Series, a programme of intimate conversations with some of my most badass friends. This series aims to provide honest, motivating and no-nonsense perspectives from people who've been there and muddied the t-shirt to inspire you as part of your own personal growth journey. I've carefully selected a set of inspirational guests who've done incredible things but who I think we'll all find are very much just like us. Through their stories and wisdom, I hope you're going to find pertinent little nuggets that will fuel your growth and help you to realize your potential. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to my second ever podcast guest, Lottie Unwin. Lottie is the founder of The Copy Club, which is the home for entrepreneurial marketers. And she's going to tell us more about that in a minute. Now, I met Lottie when I was doing the Marketing Academy five years ago, and I've been so inspired by Lottie's journey ever since. She's gone from head of marketing at Propercorn to then taking her side hustle and making it into a powerhouse for marketers. So without further ado... Let me introduce my guest, Lottie. Lottie, hello. Hi, Al. Hi, darling. Thanks so much for taking part. It's an absolute pleasure. It's, I can't believe it's been five years. I know. Mental, how much can change in this, such a short space of time, relatively, anyway. Um, yeah. I mean, five years actually sounds like quite a long time. It's true. Um, which is such a testament. Like, you've got, like, a baby in a business um, since we first met, like, having wine and a cigarette at the back of those parties yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah it's been so it's been like so nice to kind of be on this journey together I feel like we've had some really like marked conversations over that five-year period where we could probably draw like a really nice graph of like the progress we've both been on exactly. <laughs> with the peaks and drops and that is precisely why I thought you'd make such a brilliant yeah. uh, guest for us today so First off, why don't you just tell us a little bit more about the Copy Club and then I'd love to move on to your journey to founding the business. Absolutely. So Copy Club is a community for people in marketing, Uh, marketing of all shapes and sizes, uh, typically those who are under pressure to think entrepreneurially, um, which when I started a supper club eight years ago was just those in kind of founder-led businesses working off a kitchen table. But actually now in the world of like challenger brands and all the blue chips being threatened really is um, a space for anyone who's trying to think about how to do marketing differently. Um, And we exist to make our members' lives easier. And that for us means two things. So one is practical support. So I don't know how to do something and I could spend all night Googling it or I could ask someone for the answer or I could watch a video of someone explaining how this works. Um, so we have services like helping you find a freelancer. We have lots of resources. We have a Slack group that is like dynamic to say it, friend, like fondly, um, sometimes completely overwhelming, but just full of like amazing souls helping each other out. And then the other thing we do is we support emotionally. So actually a huge amount of, of what a community can offer is just that feeling that you're not on your own and the reassurance that there isn't the right answer to any of this stuff and you're not searching for a silver bullet instead you're all just muddling through kind of like everyone else and and so that's shoulders to cry on in lots and lots of different ways um and that's the community we are now um over a thousand members we have a newsletter that's much bigger than that but a thousand plus active members who come to parties come to supper clubs get involved in slack um, join our talks uh jump on coffee chats with other members all the time um, and then around that, uh, the community itself doesn't kind of make any money as such. We do it because we really believe in it and because it's saved my career and my soul so many times. Um, so there's two two kind of subsidiary businesses, which I guess are how we keep the lights on. And um, so one is matchmaking, which is our version of recruitment. So recruitment, uh, but friendly and not like recruitment as you've ever seen it before. I mean, just a name. It's yeah. brilliant. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Just like injecting a bit of love and humanity into an industry that's been a bit tarnished by commission. Um, and Brand Hackers, where we run outsource marketing teams for startups. So founders who are too small to want to hire a full stack marketing team themselves come to us and have a timeshare. And that's what we do. And I've been doing it for a very long time in lots of different ways, um, but only for a few years kind of as a business. It's been a bit of a roller coaster. Amazing. when we met it was absolutely not what it is today well so let's talk about that because I think it's so important to talk about the journey which mm. sounds a little bit cliche but it's easy to look at these people and these businesses and think oh they've always been like that but 
every single one of those people, even Jeff Bezos started in a garage in a garage and, and uh, with like shitloads of books surrounding him. Right. We all start from somewhere. So tell us a bit more about life before the coffee club, what you were doing and then how coffee club came to be a thing and how it's developed since then. Yeah. So I was at, and I think it's so important, like, maybe Jeff Bezos had an idea. I never had an idea. Like if you read the everything store, he like sits in his garage and like imagines this library of books. Like that's so not my story and why I will never be Jeff Bezos. Um, (laughs) I uh, was at Procter & Gamble at the start of my career. And I never thought big business was going to be for me. I kind of thought I was a startup type, but I got the PNG offer and everyone told me it was the best marketing training. And so I kind of turned up on day one feeling a bit clueless and to a retail park in Weybridge, not, not knowing that it was in Weybridge. That was my first mistake. <laughs> um, glamorous. I know I turned down the L'Oreal offer, like the L'Oreal interview process, because I was like, I can only do one. And then someone told me that one was in Hammersmith and the other was in Weybridge. I was like, balls. I've really, really made the wrong <laughs> call here. Should have done my homework. Um, but I actually loved a lot of corporate life like we were flown to Geneva to sit in classrooms to learn about how to do marketing we had a learning center it was this building that was just like dedicated to training and we'd go off to the learning center twice a week at lunch to have a presentation on something Um, and I just thought it was phenomenal and I went on to uh, like do a lot of kind of extracurricular work like helping develop the the learning program Um, and I was really enjoying like having this network of other marketing people across all the different PNG brands. And then I went to Propercorn, where I was like head of marketing in huge inverted commas, like head of because they had no like other name for me and that they were paying me slightly more than the other people in the team. And so I had to have like a grandiose title, but I didn't have any of the answers. I, th- I really thought I did. I came in with a real ego problem and um, was absolutely taken down a peg or two by the reality of startup life. And then... Um, I just realized at Propercorn that life was really tough when you were alone and when there was no one else in the business that you could go to and say like, help, I'm really struggling. So I started a supper club where I kind of just invited 12. I can't even tell this story without like over egging it retrospectively. Like I didn't start a supper club. I just invited some people to have dinner with me. And, And then after that first event, it felt like a really good thing and everyone was asking me when we were doing it again and so then it kind of began to to feel like something formal Um, and that was now eight years ago and and basically what happened is like a sticky note on my desktop of of names of other people who worked in marketing just grew and grew and grew um and then by the time I did the marketing academy so it's quite a good like milestone to hang things off I'd started doing some breakfast trainings and we were running I, again I say we it was absolutely just I I was running some sessions around like topical things alongside some dinners um but that was all it was at that point and then then I went freelance because I wanted to move abroad so I moved to India for a few years and it was in that transition when I had the opportunity to think a bit and to kind of step away from the London landscape that I realized that I was really solving a problem um And at that point, instead of trying to set up business B, I began to think really differently about what the value that Coffee Club could offer members might be. And and actually to think about it in those terms. Before then, I'd not asked anyone for any money other than a deposit to confirm they were coming to events. I was running like a deposit basis, which I think was like four pounds, just that I had some certainty of turnout. But then I began to flip that and think, right, there probably is a value equation here. And that's where I started trialing things like the recruitment fee. And that's where it began to build into something that felt self-sustaining. Um, and from those early roots, it's kind of just grown and grown and grown and really like really taken root. Um, and now, yeah, now it's like a pretty big thing. Like we were just catching up before this about how, you know, suddenly there's a team of 20 and quite a big like marketing content production machine to keep running um which is a total joy but yeah it's not the Bezos plan like it does take me by surprise as opposed to being like all part of the master plan 
the master plan. I love that idea. It's like I I talk about in my workshops, unless you're Neo from the Matrix or Harry Potter, you weren't given some preordained status of the one and you've got to do this. And some people are born and they want to be doctors or vets. But for most of us, we start our careers we have no fucking clue what we're doing. We're like, oh, maybe I'll try marketing because I think I'm creative and I quite like people. And then we just go through life trying to figure out what we like, what we don't like and trying to do more of the things we like and more of the things we don't like. And I think what your story really embodies is this concept that I teach called follow the scent, which Mm. is if you have energy for something, if you enjoy something, it's about trying to find that smell and following it Mm. and seeing if you like the smell of this and if you don't like the smell of that, and just following almost those nuggets of energy, those breadcrumbs, if you will, to see where they take you. And then those will open windows that will open doors that you'll slip through a cat flap. And before you know it, you've got a business of 20 people because you've just followed the opportunities and the things that gave you energy. Does that resonate? Yeah, absolutely. I think all I've done is, well, I've probably followed two cents actually, it's a really interesting metaphor. One, what do my members need? I've been absolutely obsessively focused in giving the community what they need when they need it. And that's meant like a COVID hotline when everyone lost their jobs or um, like very practical advice on like how to manage changing budgets, which is what we're focusing on at the moment for obvious reasons. Like It's just been very short term, but intentionally so, like strategically short term, because as well and good as it is to have a sexy 12 month roadmap for the, for the training we're going to run, like, I don't know what people want to know right now. And, you know, we had no idea that TikTok was going to be such an important part of the work we do when we work in brands that's like really emerged in the last 12 to 18 months. There's no way I could have planned for that being something I needed to resource. So I think that's like one scent. And then the other scent personally is that I've remained very focused on what I'm good at and really try to like structure a lot of the way we work, the way we bring ourselves to a situation, like our tone of voice, our positioning to to keep that like, I mean, I think authentic is a bit of a kind of hollow word, but just to keep that very focused on where I can do a disproportionately good job. And that's actually just like really nailing down on on my strengths and kind of building my team around that. So I think I probably followed those two things and at times they've kind of come together really nicely. Um, I'm sure there are times where they've like smashed apart horrendously. Um, But on the whole, I think that's been the journey. I love it. So if my listeners are here and they're thinking, how can I take what Lottie's saying? I'm going to paraphrase it's you know the beginning following the energy but the things that are coming out as things that people need then being really dogged about what do my customers want and making sure that you're delivering against that in whatever shape or form that takes in, in in what you're doing and then being really clear on what are your strengths which aren't just what you're good at but a key part of strengths is about what you are good at which is often correlated with the things that you enjoy and that Mm. you get your energy from and finding ways to bring those things together yeah I think I think it's the pairing that's so important because hearing you play that back I can think of so many examples of brilliant founders working in businesses where there's frankly just not consumer demand and you might have a passion to bring something to the world but if you're not like in a way that passion can be quite blinding Mm. and can kind of stop you seeing like stop you having the humility to say this actually just isn't, isn't right. And so I think like a servant ethos where you can get to a position where you like really channel that everything you do is it is like in the, in the contribution or the the support of a a core group of people. I think it's that mindset that's really helped me stay focused. Love it. But at the end of the day, and I think some people, they're quite fearful about trying something. You have to try to see whether or not there is customer demand. If you don't try, you'll never know, right? So you have to give it a go, see what happens. Then maybe you pivot because actually the demand's like this or because things are changing and you need to be agile. So yeah, yeah you've got to start somewhere, right? Exactly. And like, and, and do that honestly, like really be MVP about it. I think, again, like I see so often kind of ego get in the way and someone like overwrap an initial idea 
because they want it to be brought to the world in this like beautiful, perfect, aesthetic, ideally created format. And actually all of that is wasted energy. The only thing that matters is like, is that seedling concept relevant or not? And so when I first started doing matchmaking, basically I looked around the industry and realized a load of people had jobs because I'd introduced them to people and had a bit of a facepalm moment where I was like oh no recruiters make loads of money from this and I think I've mugged myself off like I think (laughs) I think I've missed out on some like serious cash so I was like well I wonder what would happen if next time someone says to me can can you find me someone for this role if I was like sure but it's going to cost you an amount of money so I made an email signature there was no graphic it was just Sure, I, it was just basically template text. Like, sure, I can help. If I find you the right person, I'll invoice you 250 pounds after they start. Let me know if that's okay, Lottie. And every time I got that email, I just send the template and I send it 10 times and 10 times they said yes. And so I edited the template and made it 500 and 10 times they said yes. And I've basically been doing that now for five years until we're at the point where we charge like very credible amounts and you know the email template has a link to some terms in but it's no more complicated than that we still don't have a website we still don't have a pitch deck it's just written like it's just off some copy and like off a little bit of spiel and I think keeping it that simple like MVP is like what three sentences can I write that's going to put this proposition in front of three people MVP is not the Wix website that takes you all weekend and so I just completely agree with what you're saying, but I, um, I think it's like another example of humility, like not, not needing it to be like a representation of your whole identity. Yeah. And better done than perfect just feels like the clearest oh, saying here. Like yeah. Lottie, you were one of the first people on the first ever public facing course that I ran that was back yeah. in January, 2019. And it was in quite a shit conference room in Russell Square and I basically bought like a load of penguins and diet cokes and asked my friend to do a talk and bring some lunch with us and I still I got 20 people signing up I had my mum I had my mum helping me out but when I sold 20 tickets and trust me it was fucking hard fogging those tickets I'm not gonna lie but it made me realize okay there's something here I had 20 people pay me you know I can't even remember what I was charging then like maybe a hundred pounds or something um for a one day workshop and it gave me the faith that I could try it again and yeah and, and, and see what happens so yeah I love I love and by by the way MVP minimum viable product, viable product anybody yeah. doesn't know that the startup ling- lingo all right fab so you've gone from MVP although it sounds like you're always an MVP mode at the company mm. club, which I love to a business that's generating quite serious revenue with a big payroll at the end of the month 20 people yeah tell us about how you've built that business and the success that you've created and and maybe some 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 hacks and ideas about how you've managed to do that if we can pick your brains that really Um, well we are bootstrapped and that means that everything has to generate cash because there is no safety net and that's meant that my process has been really simple, which is every person who's joined the team has joined because there's a really clear, compelling business case for why they're going to be a sensible decision for the business. Mm-hmm. So uh, I hired an assistant, Hope, who's still with us, who runs our community and is like an absolute bedrock of everything we do. She, uh, joined very early on when it was clear that I had enough freelancing revenue that that I needed the support and that I could comfortably pay for that. Then Fran, who was our next employee, uh, started volunteering while she was on furlough. She just came to me from furlough and said, I'm really bored. I'm a member. Can I do anything? And she started running an events program and it became quite clear that if she could get the events program to the point where it generated enough revenue to pay for her salary, then she could have a job. And, and she did it and she had a job and she worked with us for a long time. And that, that patterns really continued. So I didn't take until very recently, six months ago, I didn't take any risks in terms of hiring. Like in every case I'd stress tested the numbers and it did not feel like there was a way it could go wrong. Um, that has huge advantages in terms of like 
safety financially, which for me was a really clear value. Like I am not the kind of person who can uh, make payroll by a pound and pay someone late and chase invoices, like a financial stress for various reasons. Like in my childhood, there's a lot of financial stress and I'm just like absolutely point blank, not interested in it. Plus just one. Like, yeah, just like, nah, not for me. Don't want to do it. Don't want to go near it. Means I will never be a millionaire. Fine. Um, and, and so there are real advantages in that it's meant I've avoided that. It's put the team under a lot of pressure and it, you know, the respect and gratitude I have for everyone who's been part of the journey, especially in the early years in Copy Club is just phenomenal because they've shouldered that responsibility and, and basically like being entrepreneurs within this like umbrella of what we're doing, which is like fundamentally what I'm asking of them, which is like generate your own business. Sure. Here's a support structure, but, um, and, and like, you've got all my time and help. And I mean, it's, it's not like they're on their like out of the door if they can't make it work, but like they're, you know, they're participating in that and they're really like taking ownership and, and sort of running their own little businesses. It all kind of feels quite apprentice style. Um, and so that's been tough and has meant that we've been overstretched a lot because we're winning work before we resource it. That's changed in the last few months. So we've, we've kind of hit a point kind of coming into this year really, where we said, we're going to hire ahead of our growth. And that personally has felt really stressful, but it's the right thing to do in terms of like managing workloads a bit more um, kind of calmly. So I think I'm a huge advocate in like of the, of the kind of the struggles of bootstrapping and and how it's like a completely viable way to run and scale a business. And it's a incredible choice. Just in case people didn't know. So bootstrapping um, is the difference between funding everything yourself. And that's not from a nest egg like just to be clear that's not like oh my trust fund at all that's my freelance revenue like literally copy kill bank account freelance revenue came in what I was earning from my freelance revenue enabled me to hire my first assistant what me and my assistant hope were both bringing in meant that we could hire someone else so the, the bank balance at the start was zero there's no cash injection from someone else so that's bootstrapping versus a more typical model for running a business where you raise some money and then by raising that money, it allows you to have a period of time where you're not generating revenue greater than your costs. Um, and, you know, all of the all of the chat is around, like, how great it is to have raised X million and how fantastic it is to have done this crowdfund. And, and there's, a, there's a lot of, like, celebration of having raised money. And actually, I think there's um, a lot to be said for doing it differently. So that was that, like you know, to come back to your question, kind of how did I get there? It was really step by step, robust business case at a time, looking risk really in the face and trying to be very realistic about what could go wrong so that, um, you know, so that I was running quite a cautious, cautious business because that was like the way I chose to approach it. Mm. And I think a lot of what we can take from you um, and this story is a lot around like being being scrappy, um, like keeping things lean and not spending money until you need to spend money. Like at the beginning, you don't need to, as you say, you don't need to have some powerhouse website that's got all the bells and whistles. You can do things actually quite simply to test the proposition. And then once you've got the belief and the confidence that yes, I can afford to hire that person or build the fancy website or invest in a fancy uh, office space. But before that, to just to just proof of concept, basically. Absolutely. And, and always, always proof of concept. You know, you, know I, I, you just said back to me that like, it's always MVP at Copy Club, which I've not really thought about in those terms, but like you never stop needing to prove concept because the market you're operating in is changing all the time. Yeah, I love it. Okay. So tell me about some of, some of the most difficult parts to building Copy Club. Um, there's probably two big challenges. One is like we can't get the word out fast enough you know we have really brilliant feedback uh our members love what we do and yet there aren't enough of them like they don't they don't sign up we hear three times a day like I wish I'd found you earlier this is amazing and I'm like I wish you found us earlier too (laughs) and I'm you know and I'm doing all I can 
within the constraints of like the resources we have and and to get the word out there but that we still have a really big challenge in in encouraging someone to take the leap and to throw themselves in and our awareness is now like all right I think you know a, a number of people have heard of what we do it's really changed me I used to kind of go like hi so I run this thing called the copy club and this is what it is blah 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 and and now sometimes people are like oh my god I've heard of that and I'm like okay this is this is a shift so that shift has happened but it now it's like right, why what are you what have you done about that and part of it is that we don't we're not that good at articulating what we do but actually the, the challenge behind that is that what we do is quite complicated nuanced rich not like anything else and therefore it's difficult to explain at scale in a way that gets people involved. So that's one big challenge is just like, you know, you've got a good thing and you just can't get it out there fast enough. And actually if I had all the money in the world, I wouldn't know how to. It's not as though I'm like, if only I could go on TV, like that's not gonna work for us either. So there's this real like interesting riddle at the heart of what we do, which is like, how do we get this good thing in front of enough people? And how do we get them to jump in? Oh, but I can massively empathize with that. And I think anybody listening to this yeah. who's building their own business, yeah. you're like, I've got this amazing product that scores nine out of 10 in feedback and, 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 and how do I tell more people about it? And yeah. in order to do so, a lot of the time, it means you or I or our listeners standing in front of a room of people, i.e. LinkedIn, asking them to love you and waiting for people to comment or like. And, 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 and it can be really difficult to get yeah. that level of awareness and, feel pretty relentless I'm I've been pretty open about the fact that I've struggled on Instagram to try and get the traction there yeah and you really do have to put your growth mindset pants on every single day to just keep putting yourself out there and keep getting on that unicorn and trying again yeah for sure but I think it, it's that and then it's right you're out there and what and that's that's my new challenge for years it was how do I just get out there and now it's like, well, if I'm out there and they're, and you know, fantastic people are engaging and I'm having the conversations, but they're still not getting involved. That's, so it's about how you convert. Yeah, that's frustrating yeah. and exciting, but right now frustrating. <laughs> so and that's like one big challenge. Amazing. And tell me a bit more, uh, um, something that I remember that we spoke about a couple of years ago, because we've both been on this growth journey together for, you know, since we came off the Marketing Academy, just shows what a good course can do. Eh? Mm. Um, but um, I remember you talking about running a business being like a game of whack-a-mole when it comes to problems and it being like you've solved one problem boop, and then another one pops up and yet it's bigger and thornier and gnarlier and fucking scarier than the first one. And you pop that one down and then boop another one comes up and I just thought that that was such an amazing metaphor for running a business and it's something that's been definitely true for me tell yeah. us a bit more about that well it's just is the best metaphor for it that is my experience of running a business you know you get the little like I don't know what game of five version of whack-a-mole I'm playing in my head but like in my in my world there's like the moment where you hit it and there's the stars it's like and there's like gold coins and stuff and you're like oh my god mini half moment of success but literally as the coins are falling there's the other one coming up and and like sometimes three of them come up and one of them is massive and like really luring and you know one of them you've seen before and you're like I've got this guy like done this but like it just never ever ever stops and they get bigger and bigger and bigger and I think that's the key thing like you do build resilience and so problems that used to keep me up at night and now like completely water off a duck's back. But that doesn't mean that there aren't problems that are keeping me up at night. They're just bigger, thornier, more scary. And so I think, yeah, kind of that's, you know, if, if my big, if my first big challenge is around getting people involved, my second big challenge continually is managing my mental health, always. The biggest risk to copy club not in the next year but like copy club in the next three years because in the short term my team are fantastic they've absolutely got this together and really they don't need me but over time the biggest risk is me just burning myself out and I find managing the stress that comes with being decision maker with being accountable with wanting to help like wanting to be useful to so many people um yeah, I just find it a lot. And there are my, there are like moments 
frequent moments where my brain just stops working and it just like will not connect dots anymore. Um, and so I think like, yeah, it's the biggest risk, the biggest challenge, like a huge priority for me is just how do I like manage that muscle that is my brain and like recognize that it's, it's really human and, and how fallible it can be. Mm, I'm sure a lot of the listeners can empathize with that. Like, mm. especially when you're a striver, I've got this new term where you, 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 you're, you're wanting to do things, whether it's, you know, starting a side hustle or just really nailing the job that you've got and raising a family and trying to exercise and God forbid, see friends. It can feel like a, it, it can feel like a lot, a, a, a lot of times. Tell us then more about how you, when you get those moments where your brain stops working and the dots go all fuzzy how do you how do you reset and kind of find that find that balance again well I'm really focusing on like preventative strategies as opposed to plasters so I had a breakdown 18 months ago that I've written a lot about on LinkedIn and if any like if anyone's listening and it resonates for them like I'm not going to go into detail for like trigger warning reasons but if anyone wants to talk about it then reach out um but I, I learned the hard way that it's not okay to be like, at the end of the day, when I'm feeling like this, I make this herbal tea. Like it's, it's about how do you remain resilient and how do you, how do you put yourself in a place where there's always 30% left? Because if you like run the battery dry every day, then A, like whack-a-mole, something's going to come up. And if it's a big one, you've got nothing left. And B, like you don't recharge quickly. Like it does erode. Um, so for me, it's about like, it's interestingly, it's about like real choiceful sacrifices. And I think I'm only recently being, being able to like really comprehend that they actually are sacrifices. So mm -hmm. like sleep is absolutely paramount, like huge respect to anyone who's doing this with children. I literally have no idea how you do it like no idea for me it's like I'm obsessive about getting enough sleep because if I can't do that then everything falls apart um I have one laptop free day a week where I don't look at my laptop for anything so that means like no booking holidays no checking personal emails no watching Netflix like nothing because for me that's really important to like keeping some rest and is that um, like normally a weekend day yeah that'd be a weekend day yeah um I do work six day weeks like unfortunately that for me is just like pretty much inevitable that doesn't mean like I work all day the other weekend day but I definitely do like a solid diary shift um I work really long hours um it, it's not like I don't take lunch breaks or go for walks or like do the things that I meant to do I exercise really vigorously I really invest in relationships with family and friends and I have enough now like understanding of my own brain to say it's enough and I take really regular holidays that for me is really key. Like I'm prepared to do the work when I'm in work mode, but being able to switch off, I probably take more annual, I don't give myself annual leave, but like I probably take more annual leave than I would in a normal job, but work harder in the sprint periods. So I think it's just about balance and like self-awareness. Um, and I think, under, you know, I, I guess like in the way I've just described that, there's like a bit of a dose of self-care, but there's also a bit of dose of like, the reality of what it's taken to get to the position I'm in and like the real the reality of like what it's going to take for as long as I can maintain it yeah so interestingly you talked about working a six-day week and you speak quite openly on LinkedIn about the fact yeah. that you do work long hours and mm. being an entrepreneur is not a nine to five do you think that sort of like hustler culture that some people are fighting against is essential for being a successful business person it's like a topic that I obsess over like I really don't know where I stand on it I think there are two I think there's a there's a there's a Venn diagram there's like the hustler culture which kind of has indications of just like graft and just like just keep going like just keep doing what, what I see is like implied like low potentially low value not necessarily strategic work like just a kind of volume game. And there's definitely times we have to do that. Like if you're just in a new business phase, ultimately like there is a degree of it. It's just like amount of stuff. Um, I try and like really try and stay out of that and like sit in the important non-urgent wherever I can. 
which is like using that time to 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 make strategic decisions which which is a huge part of the value I need to add to the business I need to like move strategic projects forward and that's a lot of writing documents that's a lot of like thinking about how things are going to be structured internally thinking about the conversations I want to have with different people in the team thinking about how we're going to sell or position a new offering so I tr- I like I do think I work hard but I don't think I'm doing it in like a I don't think it's the hustle madness I don't think it's like the treadmill feeling when I get it right like I think it's more choiceful than that um and I think it's again it's like decisions like if I'd raise some money that would definitely be different like I wouldn't I wouldn't need to do that so for me it's a choice to have more ownership but potentially have to like move the treadmill faster myself um but I don't know and it's the conversation that I think the internet I think LinkedIn is too scared to have right now which is like can you work you know a four day week with a lunch break and make it all happen and I deeply want to believe that you can like I just am not into a world where we say that's not possible but I think it requires some really interesting creative thinking around like where you're spending that time and what the support structure around you is and and that that's what we should we should be facing into that as opposed to just saying of course you can because the reality is, is it's really, really hard. And I think the, the interesting conversation comes when you kind of get past the political correctness, which is like to even question it feels quite shocking now. Um, so yeah, that's that's the debate that I think someone needs to start and I'll jump in, but I'm too scared to be there. <laughs> oh, no, and I, and I, think it's, I think it's a conversation that, we're, that lots of people are having in different ways. Yeah, like, my, but my oh, own... we're always around it. I don't yeah. feel like anyone's having like the really naughty conversation but nobody necessarily knows the right answer I mean in my experience I had a baby nine months ago I came back very gradually from maternity from parental leave um rather than maternity leave and then was working like 20 hours a week for the first three months and we were talking about this earlier I was just about I was quite hand to mouth I was able to do a new business proposal here have a call about all training I was doing there but I wasn't able to do a lot of the proactive stuff yeah I hired someone because you know all the mentors I follow are like you need to work smarter not harder you need to optimize your time and get better return and give away the things that you can delegate and blah 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 which I've done um but the truth is I wasn't able to build Mm. the business that I wanted to on a 20 hour week. I didn't give it tons of time, but frankly, I'm like you, I'm bootstrapped. So Mm. like I need to bring in revenue and I'm still, I haven't got a large team. So I'm still at the forefront of bringing in that revenue. So I recently made the decision that I'm not back full time, but I'm back like, you know, 32 hours a week about Mm. that. And we'll see how that goes and whether or not that's manageable. I think there's also a question to be had about what type of business do you want to build and how quickly do you want to build it? Like if I wanted 10 X growth over the next three years, then I'd probably be needing to work longer than I, longer hours than I am and investing more in other people than I am. Whereas I'm like, okay, the idea of having a 20 person business and that kind of a payroll isn't what interests me. Let's see what I can build working 32 hours a week whilst looking after my daughter and having an afternoon, a Tuesday today, where I take her swimming and we go to the park and I might see a friend. So I think there are there are yeah. trade-offs and decisions that you have to make. And at every time you just need to ask yourself, is this working for me? And as soon as it stops working for you, rethink what you're going to do next. Exactly. I think it's totally, totally connected to what you're trying to achieve from a business and a personal perspective and and times in your life like am I going to do this when hopefully I have a family in the next few years like absolutely not and and I'm already thinking about how like how to how to prepare for that shift and what the implications of that are going to be on the team on the business on the performance on a million things yeah yeah no it's totally exactly stage appropriate like yeah I, I I've had a baby she's quite young although someone was telling me they need you more when you're older so you know we'll see <laughs> we'll see how that goes um cool tell us a bit more about TikTok because I loved your post the other day on LinkedIn where you were like we're a marketing company and we haven't really used TikTok so now yeah. I'm trying TikTok and I'm trying and failing a lot of the time yeah 
<laughs> um, I mean, what a mystery box. Um, TikTok is uh, still quite scary to me. It makes me feel incredibly old and confused, but I am determined to not let that hold me back. Um, it is... TikTok and LinkedIn are the only platforms that are working right now. I mean, you referenced Instagram engagement earlier. The false sense of security the marketing industry and the world is in that like Instagram is still delivering for anyone is just completely unsubstantiated. And I really challenge anyone who thinks that their Instagram is worth it to go and look at their post views and actually look at the hard data versus LinkedIn, if you get the algorithm working and versus any success you can have on TikTok. Um, so LinkedIn is my like absolute favorite place in the world. I spend a lot of time there, write about everything that's in my head on LinkedIn and it's done wonders for the community. Um, and so I'm having a go at TikTok, but with the support of an amazing girl called Han, who works for us in Brand Hackers, who's like helping me <laughs> like being my like TikTok guru um and kind of like nudging me all the time to be recording stuff for her and and helps me turn it into content that at the moment is definitely not so set, setting the world alight but it's really fun it's definitely cheering me up like we're producing stuff that's like making me smile and making me remind like reminding me of, of what we're up to and like how much is going on um so I think TikTok is actually a great kind of it's almost like a um a representation of what we were talking about just about, about just having a go because there really isn't anything more to the platform than just having a go and using some trending sounds and some hashtags but just like getting stuck in okay um, so is that the trick trending sounds then trending that... sounds are key yeah okay right you don't even need to have them turned up so you can put trending sounds on silent on the back of your tiktoks i don't actually know how you do this God, I literally sound like an 80 year old. Um, anyway, trending sounds, hashtags are the key, but also just finding the stuff that's like finding the niches, like see what's, see what's trend, like see what's going viral, see what's getting um, uptake and, and like throw yourself in. And then also there's just this huge overlay of like, it's ultimately completely random. Um, honestly, <laughs> like I've spoken to very, very credible people in this space and, and, there is not a huge, like there is a huge degree of just like trial and error. Um, so Good to know. it's, Good it's a fun, to... it's like a fun playground, just approach it as a playground, but with the spirit of just getting started. And that's, it's, it's absolutely the, like overthinking is going to be the death of any efforts there. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think social media is, is, it's such a tricky beast, isn't it? And I'm, I'm really, I, I try not to, in a personal capacity, spend too much time on social because I don't find it particularly helpful for me. Mm. And, you know, you can waste hours scrolling. And I sometimes feel that that disconnects me from how to grow the channel because I'm not prepared to sign, kind of like personally invest there. But I'm trying to protect my mental health, but I need it for my business. So mm. it's, 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 a really, it's, it's a really tough one to figure out, I think. Um, I think choose a channel and make it work for you so like I do spend a lot of time on LinkedIn and I really love it and I curate my feed quite carefully so I'll like hide stuff that's not interesting to me I'll follow people that do give me what I like want from the platform it's where I discover a lot of really interesting brand work like probably actually get a lot of my current affairs through my LinkedIn feed um definitely have a lot of conversations stay in touch with people I care about so I think yeah it's about being active in the way that you use that space yeah love that I love the idea of curating your feed I never thought about it like that okay Lottie we have kept you for long enough so I would love to just ask you the final question which I know is a really boring one for a podcast but I think that it's a really interesting question and I've always found it very useful your best piece of career advice uh my best piece of career advice came from my first boss Procter and Gamble who said to remind yourself all the time that no one can do your job better than you but you can always do your job better and I think why I love it is that it recognizes the insecurity and lack of confidence 
is actually like the biggest potential downfall for all of us. Yeah. And that time invested in thinking that someone's on your tail or that you're inadequate is like, it's just not going to serve you. And that doesn't mean that therefore it should go away because I fully recognize that human brains are way more complicated than that. But, but to kind of every morning say to yourself, I am doing the best anyone could do in this role, in this time, in this circumstance, you know, I am like some kind of positive affirmation. That's not, that's not blowing your own trumpet, but it's just like putting your feet on the ground and kind of cementing your, your right to be in the role you're in married with this humility of, we all have so much to learn like the there is so especially in marketing there is so much to get your head around and there are so few hours in the day versus the potential impact we can have and therefore to be really like really really recognize that that you're not perfect at all and that there's always opportunity to improve I think that just like that little phrase marries the two ideas really neatly love it brilliant piece of advice to end on well thank you so much Lottie and thank you for listening and hopefully we'll see you next time Bye, everyone. Thanks all. Bye. Bye.